for tonight's show. Um, I'd like to dedicate tonight's show to Rani Shmat Rukka Bachayna, Washington Hanan Bugan Eden. Also, today is a Ilula of Baba Sali, a B. Israel of Katera. So, again, Alenu. And that was actually today, last night and today. And uh, maybe at the end of the show, we were uh, starting out with different stories. Um, we're tonight studying Parashat Bo. I would also like to dedicate a little for Shlema um, for Elisheva uh, Batsheva Batrita and Gabriel Lenomi Bat Esther Malka and Mamam Tikva Ajni Bat Ozet. Kelna Rafana Rehem for the name of Shukot Agu for the work of Allah. No, we're starting Pasha. And anyone want to add the name? Batlea Malka. Gavel and Omi Batlea Malka. Okay, thank you. Um, so we're studying now Parashat uh, Bo, Parashat Shmot. So very interesting, and everyone is the Balatorium on the Parashat. What's the first Balatorium on the parasha? That the the letters Bo is the Gematria two and one, which is a total of three. And what does that represent? It represents the three Makot in this week's parasha. So I'm going to ask you a very interesting question. Very nice, these three questions. How many Makot were there? There's ten Makot. There's ten Makot. Why did Hashem dis- decide to split the Makot between uh, seven and three? Last week there was seven Makot, this week's three Makot. That's the gematria of Bo, Bo is three. There's three Makot in this week's parasha. But why did God split up? When writing the Torah in the parashiot, Makes sense. All all ten parashot is all ten makot is in one parasha. Or maybe ask the question differently: What's the significance or different about these three that these three are on their own, whereas all the other seven or the other parasha these these three are on their own? So what's the correlation between the seven and the and the three? Does anyone have any suggestions? I'm just, I can only think that, you know, in, in this, the last three, uh, there is a really Shinui Sidre Bereshit. If you think about it, it's a... Uh, You're saying that it's the difference of Sidre Bereshit. Okay, that is true, but I would assume also in all of the plagues there was a change of Sidre Bereshit. Does anyone know? Uh, no. Anyone wants to make a suggestion? I just want to say that I admire the Misut Nefesh of uh, Gilad joining the shield from the tube. It sounds like he's on the train and he's joining us from the shield. So, Kola Kavot to the Misut Nefesh for Torah. So, I wanted to share with you a very interesting idea. Okay? And, and look at this. How, does anyone know how long was each plague? How long did each Makkah last for? Does anyone know? About a month, no? About Seven a month? Days. Seven days. No, so it's like it's like three weeks build up and one week the actual Makkah. Okay, very good. So that was actually the actual Makkah was seven days, one week, and you're right, it's three weeks beforehand with time of those warnings, and uh, seven days was the actual Makkah. Now that is accurate for only seven. Seven of the Makkah were seven days. Which ones? The first seven were seven days. The last three were not seven days. So that's ready. You've got the beginning for the answer. Okay, we're going to talk about why in a minute, but let's just say, let's examine each one. Okay, uh, let's go and reverse order just because it's easier. Makad bechorot. How long was Makad bechorot for? Anybody know? Chatzot laila. The the Makad bechorot was half a night. That was the shortest Makad. Shortest plague was Makad bechorot. So that was definitely not seven days. What about Makat Choshek? Makat Choshek was also not seven days. Does anyone know how long was Makat Choshek for? Yeah, three. So it's three and three. There's three days of darkness and those three days of intense, very intense. 
there was more intense darkness than them. But it was three and three, which is six. So that's already not not seven. But why why was it six days? Why was it six days and not seven? So the Midrash says this is something a very interesting I heard today. The Midrash says, where did the plague of Choshek come from? We say every day in our read, Yotzer Or Ubore Choshek. No, if you look, if you understand the in in the ways of Kabbalah in the Olam Atzilut Bria and Yetzira Asiya. This world is Olama Asiya, the world of action. Then the one, when you go higher world is Olama Yetzira, and above that is Bria. So when you say Yotzer Or, Ubore Choshech, Choshech is a higher level of Bria creation than Yetzira of Or. Now I'm going to sing a little bit deep, try and hold on with me, but it's worth it. Is it how, what is darkness? So when we know what's darkness, you turn off the light and it's dark. Okay, you take away the sun at night, and it's dark. You turn off the, the, the light, switch on the light, and when you take away the light, that's darkness. That's our understanding of darkness. But that was not Choshech Mitzrayim. Choshech Mitzrayim was something which was higher and more, uh, maybe even spiritual, than the light. Where light comes from, Bore Or, yes, sorry, Yotzer Or, Bore Choshech is even higher. So I saw today, the Nitivot Shalom explains Api Hasidut. And he said that there's, there's a stronger light, Urukhani, which is called Choshech. Okay, now if you understand something there, when you sh- show someone light, it can light up the room. But sometimes you have light, which is blinding. How can you have light, which is blinding? If you look directly at the sun, it's blinding. So it doesn't, you don't see more, you see less, because a person is not ready for that. Uh, re- revelation of light and it's called the blinding light or misanver and he said that that is what is and it's when you when you when you bring somebody uh when you give someone a overdose of a uh, light or or ruhani spiritual light that's blinding from that's Hoshe. that's how he explains it where does he get where did the light come from the sorry where did the Hoshe come from he said the Hoshe comes from overwhelming a uh, force of, of uh, spirituality, which is over uh, the top for the Mitzrim, which were just very physical and very Gashmi. And for them, it was the tangible Choshech. This is a new concept which I'm bringing from the Tio channel. But what I heard was, where did this come from? Moshe Neteya Decha is actually of the Choshech, where the Choshech comes from Gehinom. That's where he put it from. I said the Rashaim and Gehinom is like they have the Tzadikim. The Gemara says that Latid Lavo Akadosh Baruch Hu Motzi Chama Min Artika, which means Hashem takes out the sun from its uh, package, from its uh, from from its peel, from its uh, from its pocket, from its box. Takes out the sun from its shield, chief from its sheath, or from its shield. Zen Artika. When it comes out, the sun. He said the tzaddikim mitrapim ba, they get good health from it, and the rashaim in nifgeim ba. They, that means that they, they suffer from it. So if you think about the tzaddikim in Ganeid, then they're enjoying the ruhani, but the rashaim, they're suffering. So in Gainom, the choshech, well, from Gainom, he brought down to, to Mitzrayim. Now, does anyone know when is Gainom closed? Only open on certain days. They have opening days, they have closing days. I don't know when it's again on closed. What day is closed? Shabbat, very good. So that's closed on Shabbat. You know, we have uh, you have different places which is closed on the weekends. Again, is closed on Shabbat. There is even the Rashaim, the biggest Rashaim, they have a break on Shabbat. Again, is closed on Shabbat. And that's why we say if somebody is a uh, Moteh Shabbat, when you light the fire, the first one who lights the fire on Moshe Shabbat, he lights the fire of Gainom. As we try not to take out Shabbat in the first second. You know, wait a little bit. You don't want to be the first one to light up the Gainom. Uh, but that's the Gainom takes a break on Shabbat. Even the people in the Rashaim in Gainom. So now it makes sense. If Choshech comes from Gainom, and Makat Choshech was in Mitzrayim from Gainom. So Gainom is only in business six days a week. On Shabbat is rest. So how long is the plague of Choshech going to be? Six. Exactly, six days. Because the seventh day is going to be Shabbat. It's going to be closed. So then we go, 
Makat Bechorit is not going to be seven days. So it's not in the seven of Parashat Vaera. Vaera also, the first two letters, Vav and Aleph, is also seven, representing the seven plagues, which last for seven days. Seven plagues, seven days. Choshech and Makat Bechorit didn't last for seven days. Arbe, the Makat of Arbe. What was the Arbe? Arbe was locusts. Locusts, they went up and eating everything in, uh, in Mitzrayim. They eat everything that grew. I don't know if you, nowadays, if you can maybe look it up on the internet, you see, when there's a plague of locusts, they don't just come in their hundreds or their thousands, they come in their millions, millions and maybe even billions. And they just, they just eat up everything. And there's a, you don't think you can't stop them. And no one knows, you know, where they come from, how they get there, but they just destroy. So there was a heavy, heavy plague of locusts four different species of locusts, and they just ate everything in uh, Mitzrayim. But, there's one day that the, play, the locusts, they didn't eat. Which day? Shabbat. Exactly. Why? Why, Why not eat on Shabbat? You're not allowed to eat on Shabbat? You're allowed to eat on Shabbat. Why did the locusts not eat on Shabbat? Because you're not allowed to do work. Oh, but we're allowed to eat. You're allowed to eat on Shabbat. That's what we do three times. We have big soda on Shabbat. We're allowed to eat on Shabbat. On a Shabbat. Why can't eat on Shabbat? Maybe, I don't know, more, it, it was more about uh, Bnei Israel. Not to disturb them on Shabbat. Not to disturb Bnei Israel on Shabbat. I'm not sure because the, the, the plagues didn't really disturb the Bnei Israel. It was only there for the Egyptians. The question is, what's wrong with eating on Shabbat? Why, why did they not eat on Shabbat? If they're eating every other day, come in, in Shabbat, they should eat double. Come on, Gilad, what's your suggestion? Why did they not eat on Shabbat? Mayor? So I'll, I'll explain to you. Rabbi Yonatan Ayyibishitz, he says there's something special about the Yonah. The Yonah is a, a kosher bird, which is re, resembling uh, or symbolic for Am Yisrael, the Yonah, the dove. Yonah, Tibech Agbi Asera, the Saint Shirashim. Dove is the symbol of Israel. Dove is a symbol of peace, symbol of Shalom, Shalom is Israel. Okay. He says there's something special and unique about the bird. If you see the bird, when it, it takes twigs or leaves or different sticks to build its nest. So it will take from whatever it finds. However, on Shabbat, it will never take from something which is attached to the ground. Anything which is detached from the ground, push, and not something which is which is connected to the ground. Now, why is that? Is Isur on Shabbat, which is called Kotzer. What is the Isur of Kotzer? Kotzer is to take out anything which is to pick on Shabbat is a soul. You're not allowed to pick a fruit on Shabbat, to pick a flower on Shabbat. You're not even allowed to smell the fruit. Maybe you'll come to pick it. Um, but to pick a, to pick you know, leaves or grass, you're not allowed to do that on Shabbat. So the, even the, the Dab, the Yonah, keeps Shabbat. And he says, you can see clearly that what day is Shabbat, and you can see how even the birds are keeping Shabbat. So saying the plague of locusts when it came, it comes to the to 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 show Kvod Shemaim. The whole purpose of the plagues was to show the greatness of Akadosh Baruch. Hashem could have just taken them out with time in one plague. Why do you need ten? We said last week to to show the greatness of Akadosh Baruch how He rules over the whole world to show His glory, and um, and it can't be that the locusts on the day of Shabbat are not keeping Shabbat. This is the day of the king. Shabbat is the day of the king. Even Gainom is closed on Shabbat. So the locusts, they would not eat anything on Shabbat. So the plague of locusts, because they, uh, what they eat, they eat from things that were growing. So, so six days, they ate everything that was from the growing. And then on the seventh day, they didn't eat anything. So these three plagues, the plague of locusts, Arbe, Choshech, Darkness, and Makad Bechorot, were all less than seven days. Now I'm going to ask you, why about time? Why? Why was these three plagues less? So we gave the technical understanding that they were less, and that's why these three are separated. 
But you can, you know, you can make it up, take a break on Shabbat, then go carry on Sunday, do another day, complete the seven, make it all uh, numerically uh, even. Seven times ten. Do that. Why, why didn't we do that? So, I'm going to share with you, this is the answer. And uh, this is a really beautiful answer. If you look at your home, and he warns him about the plague of locusts. He's not going to be able to see anything. And he warns him about it. Man. ויאמרו עבדי פרעה, פסוק ז', ויאמרו עבדי פרעה אליו, עד מתי יהיה לנו למוקש? It's like a change of truth. שלח את האנשים ויעבדו את השם. Let them go and let them serve their God, אלוקיהם, הטרם תדע כי עבדה מצרים. We're going to lose all of Egypt. Okay, imagine if there's a whole corruption, all the crops die there, you know, nowadays, where you can imagine, you know, all the crops growing, that means that it's like all the, super, all the supermarkets uh, get cleared out of stock. There's no Tesco, no Asda, Waitrose, everything. All, they eat, all the, the locusts, they, you know, how are you going to do that? No one can survive. So this, the servants of Pharaoh said to Moshe, Let, let's give up. We yashav Moshe ve'et Aaron el Pharaoh, ve'yomer alehem, Pharaoh himself says, Go serve Hashem. That's really what you want to do. And he, he says, me ve me So you see, Paro is, is like a turning point. At the plague of Arbe, he shows that he is really ready to let them go. He does a small step towards Teshuvah. He does a small step. He says to Kodesh Baruch okay, I'm willing to let you go. Go serve Hashem. That's what you want to do. Lechu do it Hashem. Because he's Paro. Me ve me Who's going? I want to see the invitation list. Who's invited? We remember Moshe, the famous line. We're going to go with our young, with our old, with our sons, with our daughters, we're going to go to everyone. And then Paro says, no, only the men, and then he changes his mind, and then he carries on the plate. But what do we see? We see for one second, there was a split moment of Teshuvah in Paro. He was willing to let them go. He said, just for that, even though he didn't, he changed his mind, it was a rasha completely after one second. Then. But that was enough to reduce the plague for all of Egypt, the whole country, by one day. To make it shorter by Choshe, to make it shorter by Arbe, to make it shorter by Makat And when we see, you know, it's very interesting, why well, Hashem didn't finish off all the Mitzrayim. Each plague, there was enough However much damage one plague did, there's still not left over for the next plague to, to do more. Otherwise, Hashem had to keep the Mitzrayim alive just to stop them, just to show His greatness and to show the miracles He has to do that. Now we see from this a great lesson for Teshuvah. That means, you know, we think, what do we have to do in order to, you know, to become better people? A little bit more better Jewish people. So you don't really have to do that much. You see it, just a small action, it already has a big, um, big ramifications, big changes. Small things. I'm going to give you a full few examples. I'm going to say this story. It's a short story. It was uh, a young man, and he did a terrible avera. He did a sin. I don't know if you can imagine, and it's disgusting even to talk about it. But I'm going to say it because I had the initio, and if, if he said it, then I, I can say it as well. He said he went to Rav Steinman. And he said, I did a big avera. And every rabbi that I spoke to, and I mentioned I did this avera, he shouted at me and said, Rasha, get out of here, disgusting, this is what you're doing. And he kicked, they, they all kicked me out, they threw me out. I want to tell Rav Steinman what I did. Now, Rav Steinman is one of 
the most special tzaddikim that I've ever had. Every story I hear about him, you see the meta, you know, the, the Ashkafa, the true, the way of the Torah. He was an unbelievable special tzaddik. Maybe one time we'll tell you stories about Rashtayim. Zinchon al he just passed away one or two years ago, maybe two years ago. He said, he said, I want to tell Rabbi Steinman the Avera, which I did, and everyone's just disgusted by it and just doesn't want to see me. I want Rashi. And he told uh, uh, Rabbi Steinman he had, that he had a relationship with his dog. I bet if you can imagine something like that, that's what he said. What was Rabbi Steinman's response? He said to him, you don't know how much reward you get in Shammai every time you don't do this. That's what he said. One line. He said, if this is your drive to do this, he said, you don't know how much reward you have in Shammai, how much schah there is. Every time you stop yourself doing this, for Kadosh Baruch Hu, you have a tremendous reward. You cannot even imagine it. That's all he said. And, and uh, this young man left the office and said, thank you to the rabbi. He said that, just that one line, which Rastaman gave him, gave him encouragement. He said, he stopped doing that Avera. And not only that, he started learning Torah. He became much stronger in his observance. And he did Teshuvah uh, Gemurah. 100% Teshuvah. He completely turned around. He said, how did you do that? Just by thinking about that, you know, the small thing. You know, every time you stop doing you don't understand how much tzad is. I'll give you another example. There's a man, he also came, I wasn't sure which rabbi, he, he came to him and he says, listen, I've got a problem, I'm smoking on Shabbat. I'm a smoker, I smoke every day. Shabbat, I can't, I, I, I just take a cigarette. I do, you know, have many cigarettes a day, maybe a packet, two packets, or show Shabbat, same thing. He said, what can I do? I can't control it. He said to him, listen, can you, can you do three seconds? Can you wait for three seconds? What do you mean? He said, you are, what do you mean? You want to light a cigarette, okay? Wait three seconds and then light. He said, yeah, I can do three seconds, why not? So he came to Shabbat. I don't know, maybe he went to synagogue. Or then after synagogue, cigarette. He said, Rabbi said, wait three seconds. He waited three seconds. He said, in these three seconds, he said, uh, now we want to light. But he said he couldn't light it. He said when he, he did a little bit of Teshuvah for three seconds, there was enough time for the Teshuvah to come inside him and to give him the Chizuk that he wouldn't do the Abraham. He said, just a little bit will make him turn around. You don't understand the reward that there can be. So here we see the lesson that what does Hashem really want from us? The first small step. It's like we say, Pitchuli Petach Kechudo Shil Machat. Make it for me a small opening. Just show me that you're there, and I'll be there for you. And I'll open up for you the whole ulam. I'll make it easy for you. Just show me that you were taking a step for me, that you don't want to do that, you don't want to do the full Shabbat, and I'm here for you, I'm going to make it easy. And this is also connected to the next part of the, this year. The, the next part of the parashad, and Makat Bechorot, the Torah takes uh, interlude, and in between talking about the Makkah B'chot, it tells us two mitzvot. Does anybody know which mitzvah we, we talked about this week, Parasha? In between Makkah B'chot. Oh, excellent. Excellent, Mia. Excellent. You're, uh, you're rolling on fire. So, the... the Moshe Rabbeinu and Aaron come to Moshe to Paro and say, listen, we're going to warn you, there's going to be the firstborns, and the firstborns in Egypt, they were the, the prize, the firstborns were like the Kohanim, they were the, like the gods, they almost like uh, they idolized the, the firstborns. They were given the, the, the mitzvah of Rosh Chodesh. What's the mitzvah of Rosh Chodesh? What, what is it? What do we do on Rosh Chodesh? So nowadays we say Halil, but what's the big mitzvah of Rosh Chodesh? At the olden times, what did they used to do? They used to be Mekadesh the Chodesh. 
again, mikveh. You said mikveh. Yeah. So, so, I'm not sure what do you mean. They used to go to mikveh. What did you mean? What do you mean mm-hmm. by mikveh? But I guess you mean to to... every day. No, I just thought it might be a, a, an additional um, uh, reward or, or, or requirement to do mikveh on, on Rosh Chodesh. Okay, it could be that also that it could be that also they went on Rosh Chodesh. But on those times, how did they declare Rosh Chodesh? Nowadays, we look in the calendar, we see what days Rosh Chodesh, Rosh Chodesh is Tuesday, Rosh Chodesh is Wednesday. We know. In the olden times, they used to check by the moon. They used to see the, when the moon is. When the new moon is, that time used to declare Rosh Chodesh. Now, Rosh Chodesh doesn't just declare by the moon. They have to have two witnesses. Witnesses come to bed there, and they say, we saw the moon, and then they make Kadesh the Chodesh. Once they, they decide which day is Rosh Chodesh, then they count how many days till the Chag. So there's 15 days till Pesach, or 15 days till Sukkot. And all the Chagim, Uzmani Vesasson, is all, all uh, Mekadesh Yisrael Vetazimani. Bet Din, Bet Din, they are the ones who decide which days. Now, if Bet Din are not Mekadesh the Chodesh, or they don't declare which day is Rosh Chodesh, then it's not going to be any Chagim that month. No, I'll tell you a chiddush. There's something which is called, um, which is called, a chod, uh, shana meuberes. What does that mean? What's shana meuberes? Exactly, a leap year. How do you make a leap year? So nowadays we look at the calendar, we know when there's a leap year, when there's not a leap year. So in the olden times, there also used to be a kiddush Kodesh, and Betin would decide. When is going to be another month of Adar? If it's going to be another Adar, or it's Adar Sheni, or if it's going to be Chodesh Nisan. Now you see, the, the Betin, when they decide the Chodesh, they have a power to change the Chagim. That means they decide which week we keep Pesach, which week we don't keep Pesach. And it all changes according to what Betin decide in this, in this world, Ba'olam Hazem. The Taz brings a, a, in the Chot Nida. In the Yoredea, he brings down the Shema Rashba. There's a machloket in the Rishonim, and he says that it can even change uh, the biological makeup of a, of a woman if at the age of three, which is very complicated, this, but he says if Bedin decide that it's going to be a leap year, then her natural uh, biological makeup will change according to what Bedin decide. Um, I don't know how you say it in English. I mean, I say it in Hebrew. There's something which is called uh, Betulim. 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 I'm not sure how to say it in, in English. Betulim is the is the blood vessels of um, of a virgin. Now, a, a girl. Before the age of three, the the betulim it grows back. What's it called? Hymen. Okay, maybe it's called the hymen. So he said until the age of three it grows back. Now he says something like this. This is what the Taz says, and he says that if a girl, until, the Gemara says a girl to the age of three, if she loses her hymen or betulim, it grows back again. After the age of three, she loses it and doesn't grow back again. And he says that this is uh, this is really a miraculous. It's it's mind blowing to understand. He said uh, if her birthday is in Adar Sheni, okay, and uh, the betin declares that that month will be Adar Sheni, then she won't be three years old. Then it will grow back a bit only. If if they don't declare the Chodesh, then she will already be past the age of three, and then a Haman will not grow back. That means the whole. The, the whole thing depends on betting what they decide because they decide if she becomes three there or not and you see the whole um, the whole how do you say the whole makeup of nature is dependent on what the betin decide on our Chodesh HaZelachem okay I'll, I hope that was clear if it's not clear the point is what I'm trying to say is the mitzvah of a Chodesh HaZelachem is that the Bedin or Am Yisrael, they become partners in creation. Because by choosing the Chodesh, 
when they des- designate the Chodesh, the month, they decide when is going to be the Chatib. And they have a, a ability to also change the nature. Not only that, he says that a woman who gets vested, vested is, um, in English, I think vested is called uh, the menstrual cycle. Okay? So there's something in El Khotida that a woman, there's certain women that get their menstrual cycle according to the Chodesh, exactly the month. They get, let's say, on the 14th of the month, they'll get again on the 14th and again on the 14th. And he says, only, only works according to the Jewish calendar. And he says, if they change the, the calendar, then now will change also the day that they'll get the menstruation time. So why is this? This is all to show us that the Am Yisrael are partners with the Kadosh Baruch Hu in creation. And when they're given the partners with them in creation, so when we do our part for, um, for Hashem, then Hashem does the second part. And this also corresponds to, to Hashem Tzilchal Yad Yiminecha. What does that mean, Hashem Tzilchal Yad Yiminecha? God is the shadow of your right hand. Hashem Tzilcha Al Yad Yiminecha. When you move your hand, your shadow moves. So when you do actions, Hashem follows their actions as well. And that's what I said, when we're doing a little act of Teshuvah, we show Hashem, I want to do something for you, then Hashem makes that even bigger. And He's our partner in doing that as well. And I want to share with you also this Fatimah. Let me just find it one second. Um... So we see that the Hashem is with us in everything that we do. So that's also got to do with the last plague of uh, of Makad Bechorot. What's it got to do with Makad Bechorot? I forgot what I wanted to say. Okay, you're going to forgive me. I forgot what I was going to say. Maybe we'll come to me after this. Um, let's get to the last parasha of the Torah. The last parasha of the Torah is... Ah, uh, sorry. It's a Makat Bechorot. Sorry, now I got it now. Akhodesh Azelachem is that we uh, we become partners in Akhodesh Baruch Hu in deciding creation. The next mitzvah was mitzvah of Korban Pesach. And Korban Pesach, what do we do? We take the gods of the Egyptians and we kill the gods of the Egyptians, which was the lamb. That was Korban Pesach. And then Hashem joins us and he kills the firstborn of Mitzrayim, which was also an, an idolatrous for them. That was also the image of the firstborn. And he joins with us. That was also it was all leading up to Makat the Chort. That's what I wanted to say. Okay. Let's go to the end of the parasha about tefillin, and then we'll talk a little bit about basari. What is tefillin? Tefillin is the mitzvah that we have, that we say we, you know, every day since the Agra mitzvah, we put on tefillin. But what is the magic of tefillin? And, and uh, you know, what's the purpose of tefillin? So I'm going to say a simple, a simple uh, understanding of tefillin. And then I'm going to show you a story of from Rabbi Yaakov. A tefillin, there's two parts. There's one connected the lev, and one and one you put a connected the more. Now these are the the two the two parts which you serve Hashem. You serve Hashem with your mind. And how do you serve Hashem with your mind? By learning Torah. When you study Torah, you have to think. You think about halacha. What's the halacha? Is this how you do it? When is it allowed? When is it not allowed? When you're studying Gemara. When you're studying Gemara, that's the full power your mind is working. Even when you're studying Chumash or Parasha, when you're trying to understand the Shior, your mind is working. So that's your mind. What's, what's your heart? Your heart is in Tefillah. Because when you pray, pray, then pray with your mouth. Tefillah is Avodah Shabalev. You can use your mouth to express the words. But the words you're expressing is just to bring out the feeling of the heart. That's very important also to pray in the tune. In Mangina, especially Shabbat or Chagim. But it's all to be more of the lev, to 
to bring out the emotions of the heart. That's really why we say the tefillah, just to bring it out of the heart. But the main thing of that is belief. No. When we do actions, or when we all do actions, sometimes there's a conflict between what our mind thinks and what our heart thinks. And it fill in breaks the connection between them. I'll give you an example, okay? Sometimes, um, you know, you want to you you eat food. There's, there's a certain food which you want to eat it because you enjoy to eat it. Your heart desires it. You have a passion for it. But your mind tells you, listen, it's, maybe it's not, it's not kosher. Maybe it's not healthy. Uh, maybe it's not good for my body. Or maybe I shouldn't be eating it. So how are you gonna, what's going to control? Are you going to eat it or not eat it? Is your mind going to have control over your heart or not? So with the tefillin, that pr- provides you a, a connection between that. Also for doing mitzvot, when you want to do a mitzvot. So sometimes you feel like you don't want to do a mitzvot. Your heart's not into it. But your mind tells you, listen, I want to do it. So the, the tefillin gives that power to make sure you, you do a mitzvah. Also in another way, sometimes your mind says, I should really do this mitzvah, so I do it. But my heart's not into it. I don't feel like I really want to do the mitzvah. I do it anyway, but I don't feel like in it. So the tefillin helps you get the, your heart into the, into where your mind is. Because you have to work together to do Hashem. Because tefillin and Torah goes together. You can't just do one side of the Judaism. So, I will, I will tell you a story. Rabbi Yaakov Abu Khatera was Hilula. He was the grandfather of Baba Sani. His Hilula was two weeks ago. Today was Hilula of Baba Sani. He was a big Mekubal. And he was very makbid on uh, tefillin muhudarim. That means the best tefillin. You don't just buy the, you know, the cheapest one, uh, give me standard. I want the most mahudar with the kavanot, whatever. And Yusuf Baba Sali himself used to change his tefillin. You know, according to Allah, you check your tefillin once in three years. Baba Sali used to check every every year or so you would buy new ones. New ones. So Why? My, my, my that... is, uh, Rabbi Nathaniel, how often you need to check your tefillin? You check Sorry? So, to fill in, uh, you check what, twice every seven years, okay? once every three and a half years. Mezuzot, <laughs> uh, the, the, also, and some people uh, they check every year. For the shadow. But al al is once in seven years. For once in seven years for Mezuzah, then twice in seven years for Tiffany. Now, listen to the story. The Rabbi Yaakov, he heard that there was once uh, a sofer, uh, somebody who knew Kabbalah, and he was a sofer stamp. He was writing the tefillin. So he went to him and he said, I want you to write for me tefillin. He said, listen, uh, I'm not writing you tefillin. There's a line. You want me to write? Wait in line. He said, I'm paying you a lot of money. He said, listen, I don't have time. I said, I'm paying you extra money. He says, well, why do you want me to write tefillin? He said, I want you to do it with my covenant. So what do you mean your covenant? He said, I have special cover, not in tefillin. I, you know, I understand the, the apisod, the, the, this different serofim of Shemot, HaKodesh, of the, the letters of God, of Yud Kei, Vav Kei, and how, uh, how it connects with other Shemot HaKodesh. I want you to do everything. And um, he said, who are you? Now, in the beginning, he didn't want to reveal himself as Rabbi Yaakov Abu Khatera, but at the end he had to. This sofer, he was he was really a big understanding in Kabbalah, and it took Rabbi Yaakov three months just to explain to him which kavanot there is to write in tefillin. Now tefillin, I don't know if you ever seen the parasha. Tefillin is maybe the, you know this big. That that's uh, the if you imagine the, the parchment, that's how big it is. Okay, like the size of a ruler, fifteen centimeters. And in there, there's, there's four parashiot, short parashiot. Now, one so far, if you write it, maybe you can write it in one day. A couple of hours, you're done. If you do it a not, maybe it take you two days. He said it took him three day, three months just to study it. And I don't know how long it took him to write it. One second, excuse me. <clears throat>
So forgive me for that. Uh, can somebody remind me where I was up to? The time, the time it took, him, it took him. It took him to ride the twilin. Oh, so right. Yeah. Okay. So listen. To this. this is unbelievable. The story. Abiyakov takes the parchment twilin and he's looking at the. He's reading the the parashat of the twilin and he's like, "Oh, very good. Very good. Oh, wow." You look at the Shemota Kodesh and he's like, "Wow, this is good. This is good." He reads it. He's very happy. He's so delighted. He gets to the last word. And he says, what is this? He goes, what do you mean, what is this? This is the, the name of Hashem. He said, you didn't do the Kavanah here. And he was very embarrassed. He said, how do you know? He said, listen, I was very intense thinking about all of the, the you know, the, I don't know what it is. The, the Olamot, the Tzirufi, the Shemot HaKodesh. And the last thing at the end, you asked me to do a Tziruf and I forgot the Tziruf. And Rabbi Yaakov, he saw it. You know, it's just letters. They look exactly the same, the letters. I don't know how Rabbi Yaakov saw it, but he saw it. He said, you didn't do the Tzirufa in the last letter. He said, I can't wear these three. That's what he said to Rabbi Yaakov. He just looked at the paper and he said, this is a Tzirufa. The Tzirufa has an amazing uh, Kiddusha. We don't understand. Even simple Tzirufa, which is Kasher, Tzirufa, you can change the whole makeup of a person. It has a completely different influence on your day. If you ask somebody, the person who puts on tefillin in the morning, his day before he puts on tefillin and after tefillin changes completely. We don't know what it does to us, to our neshama, and to our, to our physical self and soul, then, then, then it does to everything else. And it's only on the day of, of Shabbat, where you have the Kedusha of Shabbat, that you don't need the Kedusha of tefillin. But every other day of the week, when you don't have Kedusha of Shabbat, you need tefillin. For, for the Jewish, for, for the Jewish Neshama. I was just telling you a story that I, I was amazed to see, but the feeling, and um, Gilad spoke about how important it is to check the feeling. So I had this story today, he said, uh, it was Rabbi, he said he met somebody, and he said that he's, every day he's careful, he doesn't miss a day of the feeling. And he's, he said, when was the last time you checked your feeling? He said, what do you mean? I've been doing it since my bar mitzvah. When's the last time? When I bought him my bar mitzvah, he said, let me check them. He said, no, I don't need to go. You check them when you bar mitzvah. How do you know? 35. So you haven't checked it for how long? 22 years. Is that right? 22? Yeah, 35, 22 years. He said, how long have you had your washing machine for? He said, five years. How long is your... Your fridge, 10 years. So 22 years, you didn't check your tefillin. He said, how do you know what happened? You know, maybe, you know, you, you, you're praying with them, you put them on your mind, you sweat, sometimes you leave them in the car, sometimes you leave it in the cold, you leave it in the sun, in the heat, you forget that it, 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 has, a, it has a wearing, it takes wear and tear in it, you have to check it. He convinced him, he convinced him. He said, okay, I'll come and bring it to the rabbi. He said he just saw the bag of the tefillin, and he said this doesn't look good. He opened inside, and he said, "Listen, I'm shocked. I don't know. The guy who wrote it must be dyslexic." He said the part of the tefillin doesn't even look like it was written by a sofer. It's complete amateur. And he said that doesn't even matter. He says, "Listen, uh, I don't know if you ever put on tefillin in your life. You put it on, you." The, it looks like tefillin on the outside, but inside you're not you don't have any, anything. He said, you don't ask, the bad was so, he felt so bad, and he was such pain for 22 years, every day he puts on tefillin. Sometimes it's very difficult to put on tefillin, and you have to, you know, find the time, and then you make a special effort, you do it. And he said, he didn't even do anything. You put nothing on it. It's not even kasher tefillin. That's why it's very important, especially the the Chodesh or whenever there's an opportunity to check the feeling, you check the feeling. Every day you put on the feeling, you want to make sure that you, there's something in there. And uh, and that's why you took the Chodesh Ben Echa. So that was just some the feeling. Maybe now we'll do a few minute stories of Baba Sali. Before I say any stories, does anyone have any stories of Baba Sali they want to share with us? Any questions? Yes, on Tefillin. Yeah, go on, Joe. What's the question? 
you need to leave <clears throat> extremely early in the morning to work, so yes, and, uh, the only opportunity is is four thirty in the morning to do for them. Can you do it? So it depends what day in the summer. I'm assuming yes, because uh, I think it's very early. You can do rainy nets in the winter. In the winter, you uh, you have to check the calendar. I don't know what it is no, in London. Maybe me. No, 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 you can't. You can't. It's just, uh, What's the earliest? Do you, you know you what time? Look, yeah, it depends. But um, I think that now in the winter, I, uh, I it's around six fifty. You cannot. You can literally not put fill in. I checked it. Six fifty. So you need to fill it fully after six fifty. Um, after a lot of shachar, there's time for for to sit and fill in. You want maybe I can check it for you after this year. Um, to to do uh, to after four four thirty is very early, but after six, that may be the time when you can do it. And if not, you can do it afterwards seven, eight, nine. Or in the middle of work, take a few minutes great to do on to fill in Shmuel Yisrael. I mean that. But I want to share with you a few stories about Basali. Now there's something special about about Rabbi Yisrael Abu Chatzir, Ben Abi Masud, more than any other tzaddik, and that is that. Everywhere in Eretz Israel and in the world, everyone does Elula for Baba Sali. I think more than any other tzaddik, they do uh, they do Elula for Baba Sali. Now, I'm always thinking, why is that? You know, there's many, many tzaddikim, but not everyone has a Elula, not as big as a Baba Sali, but everyone does Baba Sali. It's like the, it's the basic uh, basic Elula that everyone does. Everyone does it. What's the, what's the reason for that? Now, if anyone has any stories, I'd be very happy to if you, to share with, with us, or if you have an answer, what you think. I'm going to say a few stories. Maybe I'll think I'm, I'm, I'll say an idea. Did anyone want to share what they think? Why Baba Sali has most hilula? I don't know. No. Does anything to do with where he comes from? Well, he comes from he comes from Morocco, and he at a very young age. Um, he had the, his, he had a very high neshama, and he had the how do you say? Um, uh, oh, I'm forgetting my English badly. He had the netia, he had an attraction towards uh, kedusha, towards towards avodat Hashem. That's really what he wanted to do from a very young age. I'll tell you, I'll tell you maybe a few short stories. What, when he was already uh, nine years old. He he went to his father and he said, oh, he was he went to him. I want to use the siddur of uh, his father had the siddur from his grandfather Rabbi Yaakov, and it's a special siddur with all kavanot of tefillah, kavanot of rashash. We know when we say tefillah, we just we we think about the meaning of the words, but they had special kavanot which changes the the olamot elyonim. According to Kabbalah. And he was a nine-year-old boy, a little boy. He wants to pray with the Siddur. He said, what do you, what do you want the Siddur for? Uh, when you learn Kabbalah and you become old, then, then we'll give you the Siddur. And now what do you have to do with the Siddur? And he started crying. And then if you know a nine-year-old boy, no, when he wants something, please, Daddy, I want to give me a Siddur. I want to pray with the Siddur. And he said, uh, I, can't, I can't give you the Siddur. You know, I'm scared. And he said, listen, um, uh, I, uh, I really want this to do, and he was crying for it. He said, why do you want this so much? Why do you want it so much? He said, I really want to pray with this to do. And he said to him, look, I'm scared because I don't know if this to do, if it's a very special to do. I had a, many to feel out inside it. I don't know if the, the to do wants, wants you to pray with him. I will ask the Sido. That's what he said to me. I'll ask the Sido if he wants you to pray. If he wants you to pray with him. So he said, okay. The next day he said, no, Daddy, what did the Sido say? He wants to pray with me or not? He said, listen, I'm going to give it to you. But you promise me that when you pray with the Sido, you're going to say every single word on its own carefully. Like as if you're counting money. One. Two, three, every word you're going to come word by word. He said, I promise that. I promise you I'm going to do it. And he took his hidu and he, he prayed with it every day. And he woke up early in the morning and he did this tefillah shakrit, word by word, word by word. And he took a 
תפילת מנחה, אני did the תפילה of מנחה, every word, but over. And he was very attached to his סידור, and after a week he said, uh, his father said to him, I'm, I'm very proud of you, my son. The סידור said he's very happy with you, and he's very happy with where you're praying. And you see, the Bible study from a very young age, he was really into tefillah, into praying, into tefillah. Uh, there was a story this week, was uh, Yisrael, he was called Mas'ud, it was his father. His grandfather was Yaakov, but he didn't call Yisrael by his name Yaakov, after the name of his father. He called him Yisrael. Yaakov, Yaakov uh, Avinu changed his name to Yisrael, so Yaakov and Yisrael is interchangeable. But he didn't want to call his son Yaakov because Yaakov was the name of, uh, in the family, Yaakov Abu Khatser, had, they all had the suffering um, in their lives. And he didn't want his son to suffer like Yaakov Abu Khatser, so he called him Yisrael Abu Khatser. With respect to his father, named him after his father Yaakov, instead of Yaakov, changed it to Yisrael. Now he said that in school, when he was a little boy, he had a friend, or was another boy in his class that was teasing him. making fun of him, pulling him names. I don't know, he caused him a lot of trouble, a lot of pain and embarrassment. And he caused his memory to suffer until the stage that the Baba Sali, he said he wanted to curse him. And he told his dad, I, I want to give a krala. I, I want to stop bothering me, to stop, to stop annoying me. He's really disturbing me. I don't know what he was doing. Maybe he was disturbing him to pray, maybe he was disturbing him to learn. But he said he was really disturbing him and he wanted him to curse him. And his father said to him, you must never, ever, never curse any other person. Not a Jew, not a non-Jew. And not curse yourself. And I promise you, this is what he said, I promise you, if you never curse anyone else, then all the blessings that you will say, all the brachot that you will say, everything will be fulfilled. And this is what Baba Sali did, and he took upon himself. And it's, in, it's un, uh, unmeasurable, or unnumerable, the number of miracles that he did, uh, Baba Sali. In, uh, you, more, you hear them, you don't understand, it's, it's unfathomable. There's nothing that we have in, in our generation. There's no tzaddik which can do miracles like what Baba Sali did. They said that the first time he did Hefsek was when he was 13 years old. Hefsek, in the concept of the Tzadikim, is when they do fasting. They fast for six days, from Shabbat, Arab, Motzeh Shabbat, Arab Shabbat, six days. And his father said to him, uh, he saw him one day, he was very weak. And he said, what are you doing? He said, I'm not doing anything. He said, yes, you are. I can see you. You can't even walk down the stairs. He said, you've been fasting. He said, you're not allowed to fast. You're too young to fast. You need to get permission to fast. But he used to do that because of his love for Am Yisrael. When he heard there was a Jew, for, uh, you know, now you go to Tzaddik, you say, listen, my, uh, we, we haven't had, uh, me and my wife, we haven't had children for a few years. Please give us a bracha. They give you a bracha and I'll tell you what. He said, Bab Masali, if he had a Jew who was uh, suffering, if he's, he was ill, Bab Masali himself would fast for that person. I'm not eating anything until you give him the Yeshua. He used to fast for other people. That was who he was. Baba Sali. He was gone in Torah at the age of 27. He was already Diana. Very young age. Diana. And he used to cry for every, every other Jew. I'll tell you a story that... I'll tell you a story that he was once in, in, in France, in Paris. I don't know if he was in Paris, he was in France, and he was traveling, uh, uh, he had a driver, and the driver was driving, and he said to the driver, listen, stop by the road, I need to uh, pray Mincha. Now, Baba Sali, he didn't tell him when to pray and where to pray. He decides, this is the place I need to pray, this is the place I need to pray. He says, stop me here. He said, listen, Rabbi, I'm not allowed to stop here. He says, I told you, we're stopping here, it's going to be okay. The Rabbi, you don't understand, here, it's full of police, And this is the middle of the traffic. I can't stop here. I'm going to stop traffic. It's dangerous for the, for the traffic congestion, for, for the flow of traffic. The police are going to come. I'm going to get a fine. I'm going to get a big fine. I can't do it. Please, Rabbi, don't make me stop here. And I said, don't worry. Everything's going to be okay. It's going to be fine. So, Rabbi said, Rabbi said, okay. He stops his car. It's in the middle of the road. 
And uh, Rav Sali gets out to pray. He does his mincha, tefillat mincha. And he's there, and he's just praying that the police doesn't catch him. And people are driving past and, and honking at him. What are you doing? What, kind of, what do you think you're doing? You're disturbing the traffic. And he says, please, Hashem, I, I did what the rabbi said. He said, police comes. French police. French police comes. Starts chatting at him. What do you think you're doing? Why do you stop here? You're not allowed to be here. I'm going to give you a fine. Show me your license. Give me it. He said, listen, uh, officer, I don't do this, but today I've got a special guest. It's Sadiq from Israel, Baba Sali. He's praying Mincha. I have to wait for him to finish. When he finished, I'm going to move. The policeman, he looked at him. He looked at Baba Sali. He said, ah, oh, okay, I understand. He reversed his car. He put out a police triangle and a police uh, block. And he stood in front of the car and he started redirecting traffic. Redirecting all the traffic around the car so that there should be a flow. And he was sort of like protecting it until Baba Sali finished the break. They get in the car, the police went off, said, Thank you very much, and he went off. Baba Sali turned around to the driver. See, I told you it's going to be okay. You were scared for the police. And Hashem sent you the police to help you, to help you go around the traffic. This is Baba Sali, he was very careful in this to fill out everything that he did. In, in his tefillah and uh, managed to be able to, to do amazing uh, miracles for, for Ami Yisrael. And uh, so maybe, you know, the lessons that we learn from here, this tzaddikim, uh, maybe we are saying other things as well. There's something special about Baba Sali. He had a, a, a minhag that every day he would eat uh, uh, he would do a seudah, yichvod the tzaddik. Whatever day, he knew the days of all the tzaddikim when there was a gula, and every day, he was very connected to all the tzaddikim. He used to go many times to kivrei tzaddikim, to pray by the crib of tzaddik, to learn the Torah of the tzaddik. He used to light a candle, do a seudah. And he was, his neshama was, was really uh, connected with all the tzaddikim. And he always used to do the hulurah. So it could be maybe that was one of the reasons now, that our nowadays, Everyone does hilula for him. It's like Midah can get Midah. He did hilula for all the tzaddikim, and everyone does hilula for him. But maybe it's also another reason is that he's really connected to, to all the tzaddikim. Every day he knew which tzaddik was on that day and who was it for that sudah. So when we're reading hilula for Baba Sali, it's not just for one tzaddik, it's really for all the tzaddikim that he was connected to them as well. So maybe just uh, we'll say, uh, end of the shoot, this year. We went the lessons that we learned today about uh, starting the first step for Teshuvah. That even Paro, when he made the first step to Teshuvah, even though he didn't do Teshuvah in the end, but he got uh, saved from his three, uh, the last three Makot were shorter, less than seven days. Uh, let's remember the person who was just waited three seconds from Kirul Shabbat and was Chazab Teshuvah. Remember the man that stopped himself from doing an Avera? I said, you don't understand how much reward you can get from that. So every time you want to do something, you're like, oh, let's just wait a bit and give Hashem that little bit of credit before we do that. That will protect us from doing it.